Amen. I'm not sure which river we're going to cross. I'll have to get a chapter and verse on that one. Open your Bibles, please, to the scripture we read this morning, Romans uh, chapter 12. <clears throat> when I was a young man, I was very faithful in church. And in uh, my home church, the uh, Presbyterian Church of Scotland, when you walked into that, uh, they called it the sanctuary. There's no sanctuary today, of course. But when you walked into that place, there were in large Gothic letters above the pulpit, words which said, the Lord is in his holy temple be silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now, I guess this was a, an admonition to everyone present that when you walk through those doors, all conversation must cease. There could not be any noise. No pins were to be dropped. The problem was that uh, verses from Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, and it's really not a, a verse admonishing people to get ready for worship. It really is a warning from God about the fact that they had been worshiping graven images and so on, and the, that Jehovah is near and judgment is possible. And so, since I did not know Christ, of course, at that time, Worship to me was not an enjoyable experience. It was something that one had to do because one was raised to do it. But there was very little of personal benefit, or in my case, even worship of God in that experience. Well, I've learned a little more about worship since then, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to remind us that worship is, in fact, a very serious activity because it's centered upon God. It's not about us. The drift today seems to be a little toward that direction, but it's not about us. It's always about Him, for He alone is worthy of praise. So today, my emphasis is that worship ought not to be just reserved for Sunday. We ought to be a worshipful, a worshipful people by nature, by our new nature. It should be an ongoing event. Hence, my title this morning is Worshipful Living, Worshipful Living. We ought to be consistently in an attitude of worship, is my point, which idea is based upon the word that's used in both Testaments. The Old Testament word is shacha, shacha. We see it, for example, in Psalm 95, verse 6. Come, let us shacha, let us worship and bow down before the Lord our Maker. Now, the, the root of that word is very revealing. It's used of a dog licking its master's feet. Complete servitude is the idea in that word. Now, the New Testament word, for example, in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, where the elders fall down, you remember, before the throne and worship God, that word means to adore, to adore. So in our hearts, we prostrate, prostrate ourselves before the Lord and we adore Him. That's worship. That's what we are to do this morning. We are to fall down before the throne and worship God, adore our Lord. So in our hearts, then, we prostrate ourselves and we worship Him. Now, from the human standpoint, worship doesn't seem to be very productive. I think that's where, that's be, I believe that's why there are so many 
things being adhered to worship today. Worship does not seem to be very productive. After all, it's not easy to accomplish much when we're lying flat on our tummies, on our face. But today we have become so task-oriented that a whole hour spent in worship seems to have little value. That's why some folk may become restless during worship. I remember in the old days in this church, when we had a lot of young people sitting around, around a quarter to twelve, you would see them sneaking up to the clock. When it got to be close to finishing time, they would get restless. Why? Because to them, apparently, worship was not all that it ought to have been. They were not captivated by the word to the extent that it would not finish at 12 o'clock straight up. For the older, it was probably kickoff time. Just saying. And yet the problem is really a spiritual one. The same individual who sees little value in sitting through a worship service because not much seems to be accomplished will with no problem sit through three hours of a baseball game where very little is accomplished there either. Now the point is, only the believer, the believer who is able to grasp eternal values will see the necessity of learning before the Lord in adoring worship. However, there's another side to worship that is often overlooked, which has to do with ministry and service. In Romans 12.1, if you've opened to that scripture, it says, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable what? Service, which is our reasonable service. That's an action word. True worship is active. We cannot have worship without activity, nor can we have activity as believers without worship. They are integrated. We can see this at work in Isaiah chapter 6. If you want to turn there, that's fine, but you may remember the story. Isaiah in chapter 6 was confronted with that glorious vision of the Lord high and lifted up. You remember? With the angels around adoring him. And how in response the prophet confessed how miserable a sinner he was and he worshipped the Lord. But what happened then? Then the Lord said, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And the prophet immediately answered, I will go, send me. The Lord did, of course, send him. And this going on the part of Isaiah was an integral part of his worship experience. He worshiped the Lord, and the Lord sent him, and he went. All worship. So there are these two aspects to our worship as believers. Adoration on the one hand, service on the other, and they must be considered together. Without adoration of God on a regular basis, our service becomes empty activity. And without a life of obedience, our times of praise and worship become hypocritical. The principle is easily seen in the history of Israel itself, where God would acknowledge that the people at times were performing the ritual of worship correctly, but at the same time their hearts were far from Him. But at the in other words, they had the activity which normally proceeds from worship. They went to church, quote unquote. They went to the temple. They went to the tabernacle. But the, the true worship aspect was actually missing. Now, to see how things ought to be, how activity should flow naturally from true worship, 
and how, in fact, it is that integral part of the process. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. I want to begin now with verse 33 of chapter 11, and I'll read that. Uh, well, I won't read it because I don't have it here. But anyway, if you look at that uh, particular chapter, you'll see where it is. Uh, these verses then in chapter 11 are in the form of a doxology, an outpouring of praise which really covers the entire, the entire system of theology in Romans. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Self-explanatory, I suppose, right? But wonderful, nevertheless. There is a depth of riches and wisdom and knowledge that is unfathomable, that is too deep to be comprehended. His knowledge is omniscient covering the past, the present, and the future, and it cannot be searched out nor tracked down. Look at verse 33b through 35. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. So from the Old Testament, Paul draws two verses to demonstrate that God is completely isolated from all others. No one knows his mind, and he goes on to no one seeks his counsel. Everything is possessed by him, so he is not obligated to any Verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So in the first part of the verse, God is the source from which all things come, and he is the channel by which they are ministered to mankind, and he is the final destination to which all must move if any hope is to be theirs at all. And the final thought, to him be the glory forever. And when all of God's great plans come to fruition, every created intelligence will acknowledge throughout all eternity his glory, his divine right to rule, his omnipotence. And this is so definite that the apostle just had to add the amen. Let it be so, absolutely. It means we agree <clears throat> with all that has been said. And so these closing verses in chapter 11 of Romans form the motivation for a lifestyle of worship and they lead us to the action follow-up in the next two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, the therefore, as you know, shows us that this is the anticipated response to the worship of the previous verses. Some would refer it all the way to all of the theology in Romans, but it particularly ref refers to these verses just read. God's grace is now shining forth. He, as the God described in verses 33 through 36, has every right to issue forth a command. He could have said, you shall live this way or else. But instead, in harmony with the age of grace, he extends an invitation. He beseeches, he urges us. On what basis? That of his mercy. God's response to the miserable. It is for those who cannot save themselves. It is always extended to the helpless. Helpless. 
and such were we. So if the mercy of God has been extended to you, that constitutes your motivation for a lifestyle of worship. Let's consider then the nature of such a lifestyle. Still in Romans 12, verse 1. It is initiated by means of a sacrificial offering. And there are three critical words used in describing it. The first of these words is present. Now, this is a military word, which means to stand at attention before a superior officer. Present. The parallel word in Hebrew was used by the boy Samuel, you remember, when the Lord spoke to him in 1 Samuel chapter 3. You will remember that he, thinking that Eli the priest had called him, rushed in there and said, here I am, or literally, I present myself. And that's what God wants us to do, to present ourselves. In Romans 6, the word is yield yield, to decide once and for all, as a believer now, we're saved, as a believer, to decide once and for all that he will be the master of these redeemed lives of ours. It refers, uh, the next, I'm sorry, the next word is bodies, present our bodies. This is the object of our presentation. It refers to the sum total of everything we are, the sum total of it all. God wants everything. He wants all the keys, not only the key to the front door, but the key to every door inside the house. The third word is sacrifice. Now, to us, sacrifice tends to refer to giving up something that belongs to us at great cost and inconvenience. That's a sacrifice. But that's not what this word means. Biblical sacrifice is giving back to God that which he already owns, that which is already his. The word is modified now by three adjectives. In the first place, we are a living sacrifice. Now, this emphasizes the resurrection life of Christ, which is expressed through our physical life, because we have made, been made spiritually alive in Him. We live out our physical lives now differently. We live as resurrected one, ones. You will recall how Paul expressed this in Galatians 2.20. I I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We live in our physical bodies with all of their limitations, but at the same time, we express spiritual vitality because of what Christ has accomplished for us. We walk in the mud, as I like to put it. We walk in the mud, but we are seated in the heavenlies. Then we are also, the next adjective, a holy sacrifice. We're in Romans 12, 1, folks. We are a holy sacrifice. You will know that this word simply means to set apart, to set apart. So in sacrificing ourselves, we recognize that God has saved us, therefore owns us, and desires to set us apart for his specific purposes for each of us. Finally, Paul says that we are an acceptable or a pleasing sacrifice. What pleases God? What pleases God is a life that has been redeemed 
and then given back to him in a voluntary gesture of appreciation. A living, holy sacrifice. Such is the nature of our subject, living worshipfully. Now, there is a question I have been asked more than once. It's a good question, but it's also a very important one. This presenting or commitment in Romans 12.1, yielding in Romans 6, does it have to be done just once? Or, since I know that I, am sometime, that I sometimes disappoint my Lord and even sin against him at times, do I have to represent myself every time this happens? Now, to answer the question, of course, the word itself has to be examined. Well, the word present is a verb. And verbs, of course, have tense. So what is the tense of the verb present in Romans 12.1? Also yield in Romans 6.13. If it's the Greek present tense, then continuous action is called for. And it must be engaged in over and over and over again. Every time I Fail my Lord, I must represent myself. However, the tense is in fact the Greek aorist tense, the aorist tense. Now this tense is punctiliar. It refers to point action. And so it indicates that the subject in question, presentation or commitment of oneself, is only to be done once. And so when I commit myself to Christ in obedience to Romans 12.1, I become a committed believer. What the Lord referred to, referring to his true disciples, he called them disciples indeed. He had many disciples, learners, followers, but he had only a few disciples indeed. And so this commitment indeed is practiced but once. When it is done, you and I, born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, may refer to ourselves then as committed believers or disciples indeed, if you please. Now someone may ask, is it possible for a disciple indeed to fail? Is it possible for a committed Christian to fail? The answer is, of course. (laughs) I would imagine all of you agree with that, unless you have never failed. The disciple Peter, of course, is the classic example. So what happens then when I fail, when I fail my Lord? Commitment is canceled, correct? No. I must return to Romans 12, 1 and obey it all over again, right? No. Remember that the original act of commitment, that presentation of my all to God as a believer, was once for all never to be repeated. No, in this case, I, or you, as a committed believer, have sinned. And the result is that fellowship, fellowship has been interfered with between me and my Lord. And I sense it, I know it. A committed Christian has failed his Lord. And so when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we turn to God's gracious provision in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, which simply means saying the same thing as God does, agreeing with God, If we say the same thing as God does concerning this, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The promise follows. He is faithful and just to forgive us. And to do what? To reestablish 
the lost fellowship between his heart, his heart and ours. The committed believer has been restored to fellowship. I have a little trilogy that you old timers may remember having to do with commitment. It goes like this. Commitment determines our availability. It opens up, opens us up to receive God's commands. Commitment determines our availability. Secondly, spiritual gifts determine our ability. And thirdly, God's will determines geography. Commitment determines availability. Spiritual gifts determine ability. And God's will reveals geography where I will serve. To be what he wants me to be, to do what he wants me to do, and to go where he wants me to go. Worshipful living. Now let's move on to discuss briefly the goal of this lifestyle of worship. What is it after all? Well, it's progressive moral transformation. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Phillips states it very well, quote, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. In other words, we must challenge the culture of our age. It is, a, it is important to see that the apostle begins with the mind. Obviously, because, because what we do with our mind will determine to a great extent how we will develop or fail to develop our spiritual lives. If our minds are allowed to be, fulfill, to be filled with the products of this age, of this secular culture, then we will retain to a lesser or greater degree a worldly lifestyle. Conversely, if we consistently train our minds to think Christianly by exposing them to Bible study and by teaching them to run worldly input through our spiritual grid, then an ongoing metamorphosis is experienced. That's Paul's word in verse 2, translated, transformed metamorphosis. We are allowing the Lord to continually reprogram our thinking process. How? Through intimacy with the Holy Spirit, through prayer and study of the Word, and by involvement in the body of Christ. Church attendance. They say that sancti the sanctification process is slow, but it's even slower if we don't attend church, if we don't have fellowship with others in the body of Christ. Martin Luther understood this. He said, we have been given the Spirit, the Word, and the church, and all three are necessary to help us win the battle to live a life of worship. Interesting. A life of worship. The Spirit, the Word, and the church. Luther believed. Helped to produce the life of worship. So as I trust I have emphasized today, although the worship service, the church gathered, is extremely important, yes, Nevertheless, the church scattered when we leave today is crucial also because each is necessary 
as an expression of the life of worship. So to state it succinctly, we gather to worship and we leave to serve. Let's commit our study to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together, please. Father, once again, we are thankful for the inscripturated word. We thank you, Lord, that it expresses to us the mind of Christ. We thank you for our Lord Jesus, for his death on the cross, whereby by simple faith we are able to accept him as Savior and enter into life abundant. We thank you, Lord, for the gracious invitation in Romans 12, 1. I pray for all of the people of Wiley Bible Church, Lord, so very, very precious and dear to me. Pray for the elders during these days of transition, that you would continue to lead and guide them in choices that have to be made. Lord, I pray for each of our people gathered today and for those who were not able to be with us, your richest blessing. In Jesus' precious name and for his sake, amen.